Steven here with Nature's Always Right. Welcome back. Um, today I'm going to be talking about some interplanting techniques, why you would want to do that, and why it's beneficial. So, okay, let's go ahead and check it out. So here's my home garden. This is where I grow stuff that I don't grow for sale. So I'm growing stuff like broccoli, yellow bulb onion, garlic, and shallots. So what I've done, as you can see, so I've got my shallots and my garlic spaced about every four to six inches, and the rows are set apart 12 inches. You may know that garlic and shallots take around six to eight months to grow. You want to make sure to plant your onions and garlic before November 15th, okay, for, nor for the Northern Hemisphere. I've got some salad bowl red lettuce here. So these guys take six to eight months. These guys are six to eight weeks. By the time these are ready to harvest, these will have sprouts coming up this high. And so I'll get a nice little harvest. These will just continue on and at that stage of their life, they're gonna need a lot more sun, but the lettuce will be out of there and they'll just continue to develop for the rest of their life. Now, I've also done this with the garlic as well with the broccoli and cauliflower I have here. Cauliflower and broccoli, it's about a four month process um, to get your, your big head. So by the time I harvest this lettuce, it'll be perfect timing and I'll harvest the lettuce, the broccoli will go on and then develop its head without any impediment from the lettuce. So this is just an awesome technique. So you can apply this to any crop in your garden. So these are winter crops, right? So now we think summer crops. What are our long growing summer crops and short growing summer crops? So some long growing would be like tomatoes. Those, you know, you're gonna harvest all summer long. So from spring till end to summer you're harvesting these things so depending on you where you live uh, you know three to six months of harvest on a tomato cucumbers you can harvest those for quite a long time peppers are a pretty long time you want to think about how big the plant gets as well the beginning stages of a tomato you know it starts off really short and then it's gonna explode in growth after about a month and a half two months it starts really getting crazy and, and getting huge um, and at that point you would lose your light. So a great one you can do is lettuce. And San Diego or places where it gets really hot, the tomatoes help shade out some of the sun so that the lettuce doesn't bolt as quickly. It stays a little bit fresher, nicer, like less bitter when the, there's less heat and intense sun on the plant in the summer days. Basil is another great one to do with tomatoes because it's a great companion herb. Helps to prevent pests and bring in beneficials. Smells wonderful. Uh, you know, basil tastes great with tomatoes, so it goes hand in hand, kind of when you're harvesting. You know, another summer crop you could you could kind of combine, uh, kind of the famous combination crops for summer that supposedly you know, the Native Americans planted: uh, corn, pole beans, and squash together. That's another famous trio. The corn grows high, the pole beans climb up the corn, and the squash kind of grows around the, the base of the, all those plants. That, that's a really tricky trio to do because of the timing of it. Because beans are like 50 to 60 days to maturity, corn is many months, and squash is about like 60 to 70 days to maturity. So that timing is really tricky. I've personally never done that trio. But I know other people have done that successfully, and it does work well because the beans fix nitrogen for the corn, and the squash kind of just have a little synergistic relationship. So I just want to do a little quick planting tip on shallots and garlic. You can plant them identically as far as the spacing and the depth of planting. So you're going to space your shallots and garlic around four to six inches in rows that are 12 feet apart. That's about as intense as you can plant these. You want them to get the maximum sunlight so that they produce the biggest bulb possible. Any long growing crops, you really want them to have access to the full sun. When you're planting these, so everybody knows, everyone's chopped garlic, right? And so that you always have that kind of dried, crusty side. That is where the roots will grow out of. The other side, the tip, this is where the first stem will grow out of. And if you've ever let garlic sit in your pantry too long, you've seen these little stems pop out. Well, this is the new garlic plant that's gonna grow. And what's gonna happen is this plant's gonna grow up and develop into the really cool looking garlic leaves. So around this garlic clove, all the other you know, 12 to 20 cloves are gonna develop around this thing. 
until the plant is mature. Okay, and it's the same thing for shallots. The roots grow out of the dried side, and then the tip where the little tail kind of looks like, that's where the stem will grow out of. So you're gonna plant these root side down. You're gonna plant your shallots and garlic about an inch down. So I'm just gonna push it down an inch, cover it, kind of compact the soil slightly, and then make a little trough so that when I'm watering, the water will just stay in the trough and make it uh, really easy to soak in the veggies. As you know, if your beds are dry, it takes a lot of water to get this thing soaked. So when you put a little trough like that, it makes it way easier. If I don't do this, especially near the edge, when I fill this trough, the water's just gonna drip out. You know, so if I didn't have this drop, trough and it was just flat, I'm gonna water this, it's just gonna drain off. And it's gonna take way longer and more water to soak this area. So that's why I'll make a mini trough like that. Okay, and then standard planting for, for lettuce. There is a double like this. I'm gonna cut it out. And I chose the bigger of the two, the more healthy looking plant, because I want these to develop quickly and I don't want them to have competition. Oh, there's one more in here. Okay, so now I'm down to one. So for planting lettuce, of course, we're just gonna pull back the soil, put the soil block in, move some soil around the edges. And I'm a big believer in compressing. So push down firmly, but not too strong. So then make yourself a little trough, okay? And that, what that compression does is pushes out all the air from the soil so that the roots are in total contact with the soil. If there's like an air pocket, uh, roots will actually die. They can't go directly into air. Okay, so there we go. Now it's planted nice and firm. Be careful on your lettuce. Don't plant it too deep because lettuce is a plant that suffers from root rot. Whereas broccoli, broccoli is a crop that it's really good to plant it deeper. Because if you don't plant it deep enough, a lot of times it'll start leaning because it won't be able to support, support the weight of the heavy stem. And the base will kind of get this crook in it. And it just kind of, it doesn't work well for the plant. And those plants that that happens to, they never, they just don't grow as well as a plant that's grown straight. So what I've done is the cotyledon, actually you can kind of see right here, that is where the cotyledon first baby leaves were growing. So I ripped those off and I planted to the cotyledon level. And that should give plenty of structure for this um, so that by the time the roots develop and this is at a certain size, like it, it'll have no problems. Every plant has its little idiosyncrasies and things that it kind of wants. You know, even if I didn't plant it deep enough and it did get that little crook uh, in the stem, you know, it'll still grow ahead, it'll still be good, you know, but it's just not uh, I, as ideal and you're not gonna get as big of a head. So every year, every season, the most important part about farming or gardening is observation and you know, taking notes or just remembering it, remembering what happens. So the reason I know that, <laughs> that a broccoli gets a little crook like that is because I planted broccoli a million times, so many times I didn't plant it deep enough and that's what happens. So you know, every season, every year, you're gonna get better at each plant that you, that you work with and you know, don't get discouraged. It, even the most experienced farmers, I don't care who they are, Joel Salatin, it doesn't matter. They make mistakes. There's unforeseen things that happen or things you, that are out of your control. And that is a part of farming. It's a part of gardening. And you know, we just gotta get used to, you know, things going wrong and it's, and it's okay. You know, you lose half your lettuce because some worms came in there. Ah, well, it's a bummer, but that's the beauty of it. It's, it's not a losing battle. And, and a good example of that is um, this crabgrass. I had to fight this crabgrass in this um, garden bed to make it nice. And, you know, I'd got a long-term goal on what to do with this crabgrass, but that's a, that was a big mistake I made. I wasn't vigilant enough out here. When I first started, I did a great job of keeping down the crab, crabgrass. I covered this with cardboard and made it really nice, but eventually the crabgrass came through. I should have laid out weed mat here, or like a, a weed cloth, so to prevent it from coming up. Oh well, I learned my lesson, and, you know, next time I, I'll do that. So, yeah, don't get discouraged. Things can always be made new again or repaired.
All right, guys, got it all planted. So it uh, looks pretty sparse, but once all the garlic and shallots sprout up, this thing's gonna be thick with veggies. This technique allows us to grow the maximum amount of food in the smallest amount of area. So this is how we can get way higher yields on a much smaller space than a tractor could ever do. And this is what allows small scale farmers to actually make a profit because they're planting so intensively. Yeah, I just can't say enough good things about interplanting, especially if you are a small scale farmer, you need to be doing this as often as possible. And then as a gardener, uh, this will just allow you to grow a heck of a lot more food in a smaller area, especially if you've got a small backyard or just one garden box, and you you know you wanna have broccoli and you wanna have some of these longer crops, but you also want lettuce. Look at all this room in between these broccoli transplants. There's just nothing there for a couple months, and that is, that area is usable growth space. Uh, it's not collecting solar energy, right? The soil is just getting hit with heat. So another benefit is that by interplanting, we are protecting the soil from the sun and we're actually mimicking what weeds do. So a lot of people have a negative opinion of weeds because they're so difficult to deal with, but they serve a very important purpose. So what they're doing, um, you can kind of just think of the earth, the very top layer of soil, the top soil, you can just think of that as the skin of the earth. I think it's a pretty good analogy because microbiome of the soil is tons of bacteria, I mean also fungi. What happens if you leave your arm out in the sun for 10 hours, okay? You're gonna come back in here, your arm's gonna be red and blistered and, and totally screwed. That is what's happening to the soil when it's getting hit by the sun. It's getting, air is flowing over the top, sucking out moisture, and then heat is beating down on top and all the fungal and bacterial growth on that top layer, it's gone, it's dead. Now, if you go a little deeper, the, the life is there. But on that top layer being eradicated, okay? So what the weeds are doing is they're the mechanism of the earth that helps protect the skin. So what happens if you get a cut on your arm, your arm will form a scab. And that's part of the healing process, right? And it doesn't look too pretty. And um, well, that's what weeds are. When there's bare soil, even soil that's covered with wood chips, some plants are gonna try to find a way to do their thing and help protect the soil from erosion and being beaten down by the sun. This is why weed seeds and weeds in general are just so prolific because they are designed to cover open ground. That's why uh, open fields are often contaminated with weeds because they are the pioneer, the very first bit of growth that's able to start revitalizing the soil actually and stopping erosion. Bare ground is erosion waiting to happen, that's all it is. So by interplanting, we are maximizing the solar energy, we are maximizing the water retention and soil life. You're getting more food and per square foot. So it's just all win, win, win. And as long as you do it correctly with good timing, it works out excellently. If you wanna try this out, I highly recommend starting with lettuce. Lettuce is a, you know, it's a very easy crop to grow. You can harvest early. They, you know, their timing's a little off and you feel like the lettuce is blocking out the light of the, you know, the broccoli or the longer growing veggie, just pull out the lettuce and you can eat it right then. So I think it's a great one to start with guys. So try out interplanting some lettuce with your longer growing winter stuff like onions or broccoli, cauliflower, that'll help you guys do it. Last little thing I wanna say is I had a bunch of duds in my soil blocks for this lettuce. And so what do I do with all this leftover stuff? This is uh, compost and peat moss and perlite. And there's nothing wrong with this stuff. There's no disease on the soil or anything like that. So what I'm gonna do is just grind this up by hand in a bucket and I'll just spread it out around here to add some more organic matter and compost to help these plants boost a little bit. And I'll be bringing in some uh, worm tea soon and worm compost in the next week or two. Uh, and that'll give them another little jump on their growth. All right. Now this is gonna be my little first layer of nice compost for these new greens. Now if you're worried about a disease or something like that spreading, you know, you wouldn't want to do this. Uh, that's pretty rare and that, that shouldn't be happening. If you are worried, another great thing to do with this um, is just compost it. It would be a rare, rare situation where you had a plant disease in here. There we go, lots of nice organic matter. I'm just gonna spread this around. So I wanted to put this on first before I water so that when I water it'll help 
these nutrients penetrate down into the ground. So when you're adding compost to your system, you know, think about how nature does it. So when a forest leaves fall, they decompose on the ground, the rain falls down, and those decomposed leaves are nutrients that then soak back down into the ground. I'm doing the same thing with the compost, and I'm incorporating it on the top and letting water help penetrate the nutrients down.